I, uh, I'm just wondering, did you look at the front of the bulletin? Are you uh, fearful? Does that make you nervous? You know, even if you're a Trump supporter, and there may be many in here, you still get a little nervous, right? If he opens his mouth, you're not sure what might come out. But more than that, how about uh, North Korea? Things going on over there. We don't know what's going on. Those missiles flying all over the place. ISIS. China. For one reason or another, we could boy, we'd get a little, a little nervous about that. This whole Russia ordeal. Anybody nervous yet? God is in control. You believe that? Even with some of the weird things, the strange, the scary things going on all over the world and right here in North America, God's in control. And we don't have to be nervous. I think even uh, with all these things going on, sometimes we're, we're wondering about sharing the gospel. Can we do that in this country or other places? What are people going to say and think and do? God's in control. I'm going to play a, um, a story. It's a Bible story. It won't be that long. But I'd like you to listen for a few things. Now, you have a piece of paper in your bulletin. It has two sides to it. Paper usually does. But um, there's writing on two sides, too. Right at the top of what's probably supposed to be the front, God is in control, working with a purpose, there's a box. I want you to be looking for the answers to those questions. What was the first thing Jesus did after he entered the room? That's in the story. What's the first thing he did? Also look for what did Jesus say must be fulfilled? And what did he say must be preached? There's those three things. Listen carefully. See if you, if you have a pen, you can jot them down so you'll remember. But look for the answers to those three questions. So that's where the uh, story comes, starts right up. Do we have the sound up for the projector? Let's try it again. It did come on this morning. So I'm not sure what happened. <clears throat> I'm going to just take a little drink here. And we're going to try it again. of the Sunday Jesus. Okay, we're going to try that last time. Now we're ready. Okay. You remember the questions? <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be here together, to learn from your word. Thank you for the opportunity to worship. Lord, we pray that you'd be working in our hearts. Help us to hear the word, to listen carefully, to listen with the intent of obeying. Work it in our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's look for the answers to those three questions. On the evening of the Sunday Jesus rose from the dead, his followers were meeting behind locked doors for fear of the Jewish leaders. All of a sudden, without coming through the door, Jesus was standing there with them. First, he calmed these fearful friends. Peace to you. Then he shared his plan with them for spreading the good news. Just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. I want you to go into the entire world and share the good news with everyone. Remember how I told you before that everything written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled? That's what you need to share with people around the world. Then Jesus explained what that meant so that when he was done, his followers understood the following. He was the Satan conqueror promised to Adam and Eve in the garden. God would bless all families, peoples, and nations. The promise to Abraham would come through him. 
that blessing, a right relationship with God, was made possible through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. The Passover lamb was symbolic for him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of the feasts and the sacrificial system gained their meaning in his perfect sacrifice for sin on the cross. He was pierced, beaten, whipped, unjustly condemned, had our sins laid upon him, all according to God's good plan to crush him, cause him grief, and make his life an offering for sin. God's plan for Israel to declare His glory among all nations and peoples would finally take place through Him. God's name would be honored by people of other nations from morning till night. Summing up, Jesus stated clearly, simply, the message His followers were to declare to all people groups. You see now, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and then rise from the dead on the third day, and that this message, sins are forgiven for all who repent and trust in his name, would be proclaimed to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. His 11 closest followers went to a mountain Jesus had indicated in Galilee. He met them there and said, With all God-given authority, I commission you, as you go about serving me, whether near or far, develop Jesus followers from all people groups, teaching them to follow and practice my teachings and identifying them with me through baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can do this because I will be with you every hour of every day until this age comes to an end. Jesus may have reiterated these marching orders other times to his followers. We don't know. But 40 days later, just outside Jerusalem, he told them one last time, The Holy Spirit will come on you and enable you to tell others about me, here in Jerusalem and all over Judea, up into Samaria, and even to the end of the world. All right. You recognize the story? Stories, even, that he spoke of? I'd like if you would all stand, please. And what we're going to do is, uh, you don't have to move very far, but I want you to maybe turn around or talk to three or four or five people next to you, or close, behind, in front, whatever, and answer those three questions. You have them on your paper. But uh, the first was, what was the first thing Jesus did as he entered the room? And then, what did he say must be fulfilled? And what did he say must be preached? Those three questions. Make sure that you all know the answers, and we'll sit down in just a couple minutes. Okay? Go ahead. <clears throat> Go ahead and have a seat. Did you get them all? Uh, let's, let's see how he did. What was the, uh, the first one? What was the first thing he did after he entered the room? Somebody shouted out. He calmed them. That's right. He calmed them. He calmed them down. Right? Very good. Now, they were in a situation... You know, I talked about some of the difficult situations we have with North Korea and all these things going on around us. 
their leader had just died, right? I mean, this was a serious situation for them. And they were afraid. They were up there in that room and hiding. The doors are locked. And he calmed them down. It's nice to know. You think he'll do that for us? I think he will. What did he say must be fulfilled? Right. The prophecies that he actually even lived out. A lot of that happened. You know, we saw those pictures. We saw some of those Old Testament stories. All those things were about him. And they were coming true. And they would continue to come true. So then, in relation to that, what did he say should be preached? Sure, sure, the good news, the gospel. And it all related, it, it was all coming true, and then we should share that. And that repentance of sins should be preached along with Jesus and what he's done for us. So, that's good to know. Some people in the past, those close friends of his, were afraid. But we need to understand that God is in control, and he's working with a purpose. That's what we're going to be talking about for just a few minutes here. I am glad to be here. Denise and I are both glad to be here uh, today. You know, Denise grew up in this church, and we're always excited to come back here and see you folks. Uh, we're excited about sharing tonight. We'll have little film clips and pictures of what we've been doing, all that kind of stuff. And so we'd invite you to come back and have a hamburger or a hot dog and, and, uh, and see what, what our report will include. But for right now, we're going to be talking about this, and we're going to go to Psalm 66 to start. If you would do that with me, open your Bible to Psalm 66. As you're looking at that, Psalm 66, uh, make sure you're there in the middle of your Bible. I'd like to say that um, I did not mean anything, uh, I didn't mean anything negative by putting uh, President Trump up on the screen. Uh, he is doing some fantastic things, and I'm amazed that the, uh, the media don't pick up on all the good things that are happening right now. They just, they're all concerned about one thing, and that's bashing him. And that's certainly not my intent. And I hope if, if you thought that, that, uh, that I'm clearing that up, because it's not my intent to bash him. But uh, getting back here to Psalm 66, I've got it in, uh, I've, I'm carrying with me the HCSB, I have the ESV up here. We're not going to be able to read all the verses of, of this psalm or the other two that we'll look at, but I'd like you to, to look at it up here with me for just a moment, if you could. It says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. We'll just stop there for a second. And there's some amazing things here in this psalm as we even think about the fact that uh, God is in control or, or the fact that maybe we are nervous, maybe we are scared about some things going on. Look right there in the middle of these verses. It says, how awesome are your deeds. It is a little dark. It's uh, supposed to be red up there. How awesome are your deeds. Look just below there. So great is your power. How great is it? It's so great that God's enemies cringe before him. All the earth bows down to you. This is a powerful God. And as we talk about who he is and what he's done, look at the top. Shout for joy. Who? All the earth. All the earth is to be shouting for joy. Look at verse 4. All the earth bows down. Look at the next few verses. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. But you brought us to a place of abundance. Look down below there. 
Verse 16, come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. That's kind of like a response to this thing. But look, again, come and see what God has done. What has he done in, this, in these verses now? Or, or what is said he's done in these verses? Can you uh, pick some things out? What has God done? Just shout it out. He did. He turned the sea to dry land. Good. He's done some awesome deeds, right? And turned the sea to dry land. What else? Good. He's preserved our lives. Very good. Uh, even as we get before, the, before we get to that, he rules forever by his power. Who's in control? God's in control. His eyes watch the nations. He knows exactly what's going on. He sees when North Korea is testing another one of their missiles and how far it's going to get now and all that kind of stuff. He knows it all. He has preserved our lives and he'll continue to preserve our lives as he sees fit. He keeps our feet from slipping. He's brought us to a place of abundance. Wow. He's done great things. He'll continue to do it. And so down in verse 16, the psalmist can say, Come in here, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. We should be able to say, Hey, listen, I want to tell you what God's done for me. Should we not? That's kind of a natural response here. Remember, Jesus, he, he comes in that upper room and the people are scared. And what did he want them to do? He wanted them to tell what Jesus had done for them. And so he had to calm them down first, right? And then share some things. Look to whom this is written or, or who are um, supposed to respond. Come and hear all you who fear God. His awesome deeds, verse 5, for mankind. He's including everybody. Look at verse 7. His eyes watch the nations. It's all under his control, and he is uh, letting us know that. Uh, look at Psalm 68 for a second, if you would. You flip over a page or two in your Bible. This, this psalm is fairly long. It's got 35 verses to it. We're just going to look at these three. You can follow in your version, or you can look up here. But on Psalm, in Psalm 68, he says, May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God, may, but may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. In Psalm 68, we see a lot of what God has already done. And we didn't look at all the verses even. But it's what God has done and, and his power that is there. Over in Psalm 68, it's referring more to what he will do and can do. And again, if we just highlight him as we look through there, may his enemies be scattered, his foes flee before him, blow them away like smoke, and they're gone. Uh, as wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish. But there's a difference. The righteous, may the righteous be glad. We don't have to be nervous, whatever's going on. We can be glad. We ought to be happy and joyful and rejoice before God. So it's in, we looked at Psalm 66 and we looked at Psalm 68. Uh, many, or several, I should say, several of the Psalms are grouped. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, uh, but Psalms sometimes are related one right next to the, to the other. Psalms 10 to 13. Uh, are, are such psalms like that. We won't get into why or how, but Psalms 113 to 118 are the great Hallel. And they're all grouped together. They're used in uh, certain services altogether. Uh, I was reading just this morning in Psalms 57, 58, and 59 are tied together. And you can see that as you study. Psalms 120 to 134. Do you know what those ones are? The Psalms of Ascent. The psalms that were sung as the people traveled to Jerusalem and they went up, up, the ascent, up to Jerusalem for the feasts. And uh, those are exciting psalms to look at too. Well, Psalm 66 
and 68, what comes right in the middle? 67 <laughs> comes in between those two, right? And in 66, we have the power of God seen. In 68, we see the power of God that he has and could do and will do. We have those two. In Psalm 67, it fits right in the middle. Now, you know what a chiasm is? Who can tell me what a chiasm is? Is that the thing that you row? No, that, that's a kayak, right? A chiasm. What's a chiasm? Anybody know? We're going to learn something then. A, chiast, a chiasm or a chiastic psalm, one example of that, if you want to look at it, is, is 120, Psalm 120. I realize I'm not using the paper, but if you're following along, there's probably ways that you can fill in that paper as you go along. But Psalm 120 does this. We'll look, we'll look at it here on the screen, and then we'll see. Verse 1 and verse 7 are parallel. In some way, in a chiasm, your first verse and your last verse will be kind of parallel. And we'll see that in a second. Verse, verses 2 and 6 are parallel. They don't say quite the same thing, but they're very similar. And then verses 3 and 5 are similar. And then, and sometimes exact, but sometimes just similar. Then in this psalm, verse 4 is the key. Verse 4 is the emphasis of the psalm. So you got these ones, and these ones, and these ones, and they're leading to the middle. We don't do that, do we? We say, dun, 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 the pow, and we have the great ending. This, in these chiasms, the emphasis is right in the middle. And so you, you want to look at that middle and see what's going on. Here, in verse 1, it talks about, you know, it says, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. Uh, so you have in my anguish, he call, I called and he heard. The emphasis on the hearing. I speak in, in favor of peace. Look at verse 7. I, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for fear. And so you have this little bit of this parallelism where the psalmist is speaking, and yet he hears. And there's peace. There's a parallel there. In uh, verse 3, Lord, free me from the liar. That's what he's dealing with there. I'm sorry, verse 2. Lord, deliver me from lying lips and a deceitful tongue. Verse uh, 6, I have lived too long with those who ate peace. So you have the liar and you have those who ate peace. It's those evil men, those evil people around us that are in both of those verses. Verse 3, what will you receive, O deceitful tongue, you liar? He's back to that. And in verse 5, I live among evil men. you got deceitful tongue and evil men, and they're standing there. And in between, right in the middle, you have verse 4. Verse 4, the emphasis are the arrows. The arrows. Look at verse 4 for a second. He's, he's asking, what are you going to receive, you deceitful tongue? In verse 4, a warrior's sharp arrows with burning charcoal, or the coals of the broom tree. The broom tree burned very, very hot. And so those coals would be hot. And, and what you have here is an arrow that's heated in the coals and then shot. But even that verse is an exciting verse, and it really doesn't have a lot to do with what we're doing, but it sure is fun. It says, literally, it's arrows, sharp ones, of a warrior from a broom tree. With the, with the coals of a broom tree. It, it builds as it goes. They're not only just arrows, but they're sharp. And they're not just sharp arrows, but they're shot by a warrior. Now, I have shot a, a bow and arrow from time to time, but I'm not a warrior. And so I pull that thing back, and bing, it goes, you know. It doesn't always go where it's supposed to, and it doesn't always go very hard. But a warrior's arrows go, go right where they're supposed to. And not only are they arrows, and they're sharp, and they're from a warrior, but they're heated with that coal from a broom tree. That is what's right in the middle of this psalm. If you're dealing with, in this psalm, you know, this anguish, and, and, but God hears, and he's speaking peace. i got liars and people all around me. What are they going to get? They're going to get that arrow. That is a chiasm, all right? Well, in Psalm 66, we've got some stuff going on, this power of God. In Psalm 68, we've got 
power of God as it will be seen. And those two are leading to Psalm 67. And so we kind of have this chiasm. And the exciting thing is, Psalm 67 is a chiasm itself. Look at it with me. We'll read through it first, and then we'll look at some of the details. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest, God. Our God blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Now that's it's a pretty exciting psalm just as you read it, but watch what happens. What's at the very beginning? May God. May God what? May he bless us. Okay? So in verse 1, you have, may God bless us. Look at verse uh, seven, I think it is, or we don't. I took the, um, I took them off of this, but you can see at the end, may God bless us, right? Now look back up at the top. May He be gracious to us and make His face shine upon us. So you have, may God bless us, may God bless us. May He be gracious to us and make His face shine upon us. Down below you have, the land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. So we're building. Okay? Why? So that. We've got the so that there. We have the why. And down below we have the so that. Right? What's up at the top? So that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. The blessing of God was so that the others would hear and be blessed. Down at the bottom. So that all the ends of the earth will fear him. The salvation, the fear of God among all of them. And at the top we have all nations, at the bottom we have ends of the earth. Everyone is to know. Now, speaking of chiasm, may the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Look down below. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. When you get the exact words, you can be pretty sure something's going on there, right? And so we're building up to the middle. May all the peoples praise you. What's in the middle? May the nations, this has nothing to do, well, I shouldn't say nothing to do, but you understand what I'm saying. This is about the nations. It's not about the church in this, at this point. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. What's going on here? What's the emphasis? In the middle of 66 and 68, in the middle of 67, it's about the nations. What about them? That they would be glad and sing for joy. That's the point here. How are they going to be glad and sing for joy? When they receive salvation. That's when it happens. Now this psalm, that's what we came up with here. We've, we've looked at it, but hold on. Who's the original audience of this psalm? Was it written for Kent City Baptist Church? Well, you know, we could, we could make an argument that it was. But the original audience of this psalm, who would it have been? It wasn't Abraham, okay, but what did God promise to Abraham? Do you remember? It would make him great, it would give him a great name, and there were three strong pieces here. Do you remember? Land. He would receive land. That would be for all of his descendants. He would have many descendants. I don't know if you count, starting with, let's start over here. Land, the descendants, and what else? That he would be a blessing to all, all what? All the nations. So, that's Abraham. And he then, he was one of the patriarchs, right? Abraham, who's not, who was his son? Come on. Isaac and then Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's turn, uh, name is changed to Israel. And that's 
the nation, right? That's the one, that's all the descendants. And through them would come this blessing, right? The original audience is Israel. So when you look at this and you say, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us so that all your ways may be known on the earth and your salvation among the people, that's what he's saying. Let's, have, let's see those blessings. Israel's going to be blessed. Israel is going to then bless the nations that salvation would come so that all the nations would shout and sing for joy. Does that make sense? It kind of works together, right? We looked at that a minute ago. See, Jesus was in Abraham's line, right? And then we know the line of David. He's the son of David and all that. But the fact is, Jesus died on the cross, and he even talked about this in that passage. He died on the cross so that the nations would be blessed. So that this thing we call salvation would come to the nations. So, on your paper, like I said, you, you've, you've had to scratch things as you went if you needed to, but look at the back. It says, number five says, what is the central point of Psalm 67? I would say, God will bless the nations. He'll make them glad as he blesses his people, right? I'd say that's probably the, the, the theme. God will bless the nations. He'll make them glad as he blesses his people. So, based on that, on the above there, what would be an encouraging theme for us? I believe we could say this. We are blessed with salvation so that God's ways and salvation will be known on the earth. And the nations will be glad and sing for joy. A lot of times we, we try to, to take an application from the Bible and, and it, it, it doesn't apply to us the way sometimes we, maybe we want it to do or we, we think. But here, it's very clear the way this works. We are blessed. We are part of, I'm not a Jew, but I'm part of Abraham's line in the sense that I have trusted Jesus as my Savior, that special blessing that came from Abraham, right? And I can then spread that news. So this is a very clear, comes right out of the text, even for us. We are blessed. God has saved us. He's bought, brought us into his family so that his ways, his salvation may be known on the earth and the nations will be glad and sing for joy. God is in control. Even we saw the power in, in, in Psalm 66 and in 68. But let's look to the New Testament for just a moment. If you turn, take uh, your Bible and turn to Luke 24. This is the story that we heard. Luke 24 Luke 24, and we have verse 38. <clears throat> Jesus says, why are you troubled? He asked them. And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Well, you died. You, we didn't know what to think. They hadn't. He talked about dying and rising from the dead, right? I mean, he did that several times, but they missed it. And, and they were doubtful. They were troubled. But he says, that, it's not necessary. And he says, look at my hands. It's me. And, and I sigh. But, but look now to verse 46. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you're empowered from on high. I'm sending you, I'm sending upon you what my father promised, which is the Holy Spirit. 
So not only could he appear and say, it's okay, calm down, I'm here, I've risen from the dead. But he could also say, I'm going to send you some help. The Holy Spirit is going to come. And not just a few days later, Acts 1a, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth, he says there. So he's saying, it's okay. I'm here. The Spirit is coming. You can do this. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and love and discipline. God really does want us to share this message of his. And he's, he gives us what we need. Psalm 67 that we looked at in between those other two, God is in control and he's working with a purpose. As he appeared in that room, he wanted them to know Yep, things are scary. There's some difficulties right now. But it's okay. And this is all part of my plan. I, I'm going through the Psalms right now in my devotional life, and time after time, the psalmist is scared, the psalmist is nervous, the psalmist complains with uh, godly complaining, I guess, Right? I mean, and those things are happening, and it, there's always a plan. God is working, and he has it here as well. So we look back there. There it is. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. That's where God's going. That's his plan. We can, I was going to say relax. I don't know if we want to Relax. But we don't have to be nervous. We don't have to be afraid, no matter what's going on around us. And we can be bold. Because that's where he's going. And he is working with a purpose. What we need to do is trust him and work alongside him. Because that's what he wants, right? And he made it clear in those verses. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. I want you to proclaim. What, what you picked out on that other side of that page, what you picked out was we need to be sharing the gospel. He wanted that message to go out. But Jesus died, he rose again, and forgiveness of sins, repentance must be preached. That's what he wants us to do. We can do it. I challenge you today. Let's remember that God's in control. He's working with a purpose. And we can work with them. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we do thank you for these particular psalms that show us your amazing power. For the passage in Luke that shows us not only your power in raising Jesus from the dead, but your love for us, your plan. Lord, help us to be part of it. Help us to go boldly. Help us to share this good news with others as we trust you and your plan and your power. In Jesus' name.